Hello, everybody, and welcome to Daily Coaching. Um, Daily Coaching are currently hosting a series where we're talking with um, ex-professionals and current professionals, um, discussing all things around their journey from first starting out within the game, so at a grassroots level, um, leading all the way up to sort of the first team um, professional level. Um, so I'm really delighted to um, announce today that with us talking about this discussion, we have Nader Manoa, who's currently at Real Salt Lake um, in the MLS, um, and obviously over in England, previously playing teams such as Queen's Park Rangers, Sunderland and Manchester City. Um, so um, kind of looking to start off the topic and, and discussion. Um, first of all, Nader, massive thank you for you taking part in this and, and welcome to, to the discussion. Um, and if you can, can you just kind of start through talking to us about when you kind of first got into football? Um, and then kind of lead us up to where you are now. Um, so I was first playing pro- properly, probably around the age of eight or nine, I think it was. And I was just playing for my school, my primary school, but I was playing for the like the main team. So yeah. it was even though it was under 11s, essentially. And then someone said, oh, you should go and try and play for a local team. But at the time, like from where I was from and stuff, it wasn't as in... So I was born in Nigeria, came over to England. I was living in Manchester. And we were just living our lives. I didn't know how the systems were or anything like that. Didn't have a history of like people knowing where to go and play and all this. But someone said, oh, you should try, try out for this team. And he gave me a list of a few teams. And I went over to play for a local side, probably 20 minutes away from where I lived. And then within two years of being there, I was scouted by City and United. And um, interestingly, so I ended up going to City, but it wasn't my choice. What happened was my, um, when I was scouted, my, my dad was speaking to both scouts. And uh, he said to the United Scout, yeah, he probably doesn't want to play for you because he's a City fan. But at the time, I wasn't that big a City fan. Yeah. And bearing in mind, this was in mid-90s. I think Man United were the far better club to be going to. But anyway, so I went to City. And then I was in that academy system from 10. Oh, in fact, I was the first player. I was the last player, I think, to sign before it turned into an academy because before that was a centre of excellence. Uh, so I came in. Uh, the club the club was obviously a far different club then the academy was similar as well um, but then yeah I was in the academy till I was 17 just a few months before I turned 18 was when I made my debut for the team made my debut played for another six seven years maybe and then from there went to Queen's Park Rangers for a few years went to Sunderland I'm sorry I've been to Sunderland as well on loan and now I'm in year three of my time in the MLS so yeah it's been a it's been an interesting story Nice. Um, so yeah, it's a big sort of uh, journey in terms of obviously playing for clubs and obviously now over in America. And I think that's that's important um, regardless of any sort of age of you do it when you're young, whether you do it when you're sort of mid-career, towards the end of the career. I think it's important to kind of get those different experiences. Um, there's nothing wrong with sort of being in a club for one club for the whole period of your career. But I think that, you know, you start to experience and obviously I know, like you said, people who may be listening now and know the current city will think, well, Man City probably never struggled, but like you mentioned in there, you know, no, they struggled exactly. Oh, they struggled, yeah, the Man yeah. City of old. Um, so yeah, it's just sort of, sort of yeah. being in those different environments, and um, obviously, I know, like you said, you was at QPR, and obviously, had some of the success you had at QPR, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit, but you know, it's playing at those different sort of levels and you know, experiencing different highs and, and, and different lows. But um, taking us back then, kind of from where you first started, it's so like you said, you was playing obviously within your school, and I think so many people underestimate how important school football can be. Um, I think a lot of the time Mm -hmm. they talk about, you know, going into sort of clubs and obviously that's important because that's where the sort of structure of football starts. But I think at school you play socially because you obviously have your friends um, and obviously schools do play competitively now. And obviously back then as well, where you're playing against different schools Mm -hmm. and it's kind of almost you get to know and understand the people in your local area as well, because you're playing against obviously some of the best other players within that borough, really. Um, What was that? What was that kind of experience like playing for your school? So it was it was a very very long time ago but like as i say i remember it being like you're at your school there's not a thing which guarantees that every player who plays for your school plays for the same local team you yeah. know so you will gain knowledge about say the opposition and stuff and then the same when you go and play other schools or they come to play against you and also as well the other side of it is you know when you're younger and you you get downtime or sorry lunch time or whatever you want to call it like when you get that ball out and you go and play with your friends and it's playing like that yeah those it you re- really can't take those moments for granted because you're getting in so many reps of certain things and learning how to play and just learning how other people play and so on and so forth and it, it really like without unintentionally it becomes such a big part of your development to be around people who are your age and you know just kicking a ball around 
learning little movements, yeah. learning this, and not everybody's just chasing around. Obviously, the standard isn't exactly the best thing in the world. But at that age, just having the ball at your feet and learning how to use it and how to play, it's, it's a massive deal. So, yeah, this, the whole school football side of it, you'd have that during, like, breaks and stuff, but then you might have training or whatever. Then you'll have the games, and you then start to really understand and learn the game. And obviously, the, then going into club, going to uh, like uh, local side football is obviously significant. But yeah, the yeah, school for five days a week playing, you know, like with with all these people, you don't you don't train with your local side five days a week. So yeah. you really can't disregard that whole thing of learning to play the game from being around school and being around the people who are your age and good at the game. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think what's interesting is. Um, you know, from a coach's perspective, everything always has to be so neat and tidy and has to be a certain area you play in, has to be equal sides and everyone has to be wearing bibs. But the biggest thing I always say to quite a lot of coaches that I mentor is you go and watch a school playground and watch them go and play football. It's about 30 v 30. Um, you've got some of the year sevens, year eights, year nines, all on mixed teams. Mm-hmm. But they all know who's on each team. Um, there's no boundaries. Yeah. There's no throw-ins. They're just playing for fun. And like you said, I think that is really the sort of core and obviously outside of school as well, sort of in parks or, or, or local areas, yeah. is where you really learn the core elements of your football. And I think so often miss, like, you know, understood because people think, oh, well, I need to get myself, oh, my, 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 my child into a coach so they can coach them. But, you know, you're learning it almost mm-hmm. off of other people. So socially and through your own development, like you said, through those reps. Um, and when mm-hmm. you go obviously into a grassroots team, how did you find that sort of transition? Because obviously, like you said, you was kind of playing some school games anyway, but, you know, like we were saying, this is this real social element, playing for fun. And then you kind of go into a, a club where you can obviously still have fun, but it's a little bit more structured and there's a little bit more sort of direction in terms of what the training is or you as a player. Yeah. Mm. I think something which I didn't mention before when I was talking about the school element is the fact that I think you learn to love the game from playing at a school and playing around people, like playing those 30 v 30s. Because when you bring in the structure, you do get better. But like there's just a love to be around people you know what I mean and you just yeah. and you're just having fun obviously you don't always when you don't always do this some people strop and so on and so forth but it's that environment there like this is something special you know if, yeah. I think if a lot of people didn't have that they probably wouldn't play the game like if you bring a child in from five or six and say no you can't play football for school but I'm going to coach you every single day to make you great technically the player could be really good but mentally the player might not enjoy the game the same way other people who didn't have that experience would do um but yeah going into my like local team it was different because you have to get to know people but you don't yeah. but you get to know you have to get to know people from a, the standpoint if you don't see them all the time like if you're not from the same school you're going to see them maybe two days training maybe on a, on a weekend and then you know you don't know you don't have those you don't share those highs and lows and emotions like you would do for people who you see five days a week but yeah the structure the structure starts to arrive and the understanding and you, you start to play for things and the things at the time they feel very very significant you know what I mean? Like you, what you, yeah. you start to build that desire to win, that us versus them and stuff like this. And obviously you'll know people on the other side because of the fact that, you know, you, you might go to school with them or you've played them for school, but it's just that diff- it's just a little bit different. The team and the mentality starts to change a little bit. And I've seen it, I've seen it break some people, but I've seen some people really love and thrive, that, thrive in that situation. And yeah, I, I'd say I loved it, but I, <laughs> interesting, I played for my age group and the age group up and, I, I just love the game. I just love playing. That was always what it was from when I was a kid. Like, I was the same as everybody else. Say, in the summertime, you go and play football in a park or whatever. I'd be there for hours on end. Now the thought of it, like, it hurts my back just thinking about it. Um, but, yeah, I played for my age group and age group above. My age group was a good team. Well, not a good team. My age group was a successful team. But the age group above, we finished second bottom one year. And we won two games and lost all the others. And the two games we won were against a team who was at the bottom. We beat them 4-3 and 7-6. And we're getting <laughs> smacked around by absolutely everybody. But in the same breath, I had that other side. So I was playing Saturday and Sunday. But I just love to be in that environment, to get the chance to compete, get the chance to be better. And we understood that that league was probably too high level for us. Yeah. But did it change the way we approach games? Absolutely not. And we did get better. And then that next year, we ended up winning a cup competition against the team. So we beat a team in the semi-final who hadn't lost for like four years. I just remember seeing the tears running down their face. Like, go back to where we were a year ago. We'd, we'd win two games a season. Like, you know what I mean? But those were great times. 
Nice. And, and again, it makes a lot of sense because, again, as we were kind of talking about those sort of different, when I said about different clubs and you kind of get those different environments, I think it's exactly the same with youth football as well. So many coaches, and, and don't get me wrong, I get it, it's competitive and, you know, people want to win and but not even be the coach. Sometimes just the players, they want to win games. But I think mm-hmm. interesting that you mentioned about sort of like you still found enjoyment even when your team was you know, well, not necessarily when they're losing, but, you know, in that sort of losing yeah. environment. And I think that's important because um, yeah. so many people, and, and it's a word that in, in football we're so scared to, to mention so many times, failure, you know, because people deem yeah. failure as a bad word because that's how it's been used. But, you know, failing yeah. at something doesn't mean that something's over. You know, it just means that, again, yeah. I can't remember the abbreviation, but it's something about, you know, an opportunity to learn we were failing meaning yeah. that so i think it is that important factor mm-hmm. and i think even in terms of you know, credit to yourself and what you've gone on to go and do that potentially if you it's just in that isolation of that team where you're always winning every single game and it's like 10 nil and you know yeah. you're not really learning at all because it's kind of just this is what you expect to happen yeah. and when it doesn't happen how do you deal with that psychologically it's a tough battle yeah that's a good point because as i've t- as i've been a professional now for um i think 16 17 years when teams have been doing well, I was always wary of a team, if I was ever in a team that was winning games, but weren't playing well, because certain things start to slip through the cracks. Yeah. And you're actively getting worse at something, but yeah. you're fortunate at the moment in time because you're just getting the points. Whereas like some of the best managers I've had and best players I've been around, they acknowledge that a win, although it's the end objective, it's about how you do it. So you can yeah. gain understanding in losing, gain understanding in winning, and appreciate what is good and what is bad in regards to the result itself. Yeah. And if you say if we're like Academy, sorry, no, that Sunday league team and we're getting smacked around, if we were getting better on a week to week basis, there's reason to be happier. You know, obviously we don't want to keep losing, but we're getting better. But some of the teams are always winning. You could argue they're getting worse because the way that yeah. they approach a game against us is they're too lax, they make lots of mistakes, they're not this, they're not that. But then at some point, there's going to be a switch. And that, as I say, it always happens. Like it's the same reason. Like you see, as the professional ranks now, if a team loses, and you speak to a manager, if a manager is honest, he'll tell you whether it was good or whether it was yeah. bad. If a team wins, a good manager tells you whether it was good or it was bad because they have a strategy, they have an idea, and if that works out, but they don't get the result, they know that there's progress. You might not get the three points momentum, but there's progress within the team and all that stuff. It makes a huge, huge difference once you start to finally understand how it works. Yeah, no, I agree. I think again, a lot of and it's not to criticise some coaches, but some coaches and managers will look at purely factors and numbers and, and, and data, but, you know, they're not understanding the, or they don't have the understanding of it. So, you know, yeah, a team may be unbeaten for 30 games, but understanding why that team is unbeaten for 30 games, yeah. like you said about your, your team who you was like not doing as well with, they was possibly in the wrong league. Well, you may have the opposite, a team that's doing really, really well, oh, brilliant, 30 games unbeaten, they saw a record 500 goals in a season. But all of a sudden, yeah. it's because they're in the wrong league. You know, they're, 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 they're yeah. too competitive for that league. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. it is that way of understanding or having the understanding of why, you know, certain things are happening um, and why certain things potentially aren't happening um, within your game. For sure. Um, for sure. But um, so kind of looking then again on, like you said, you've obviously played for your, your grassroots team. And again, I think it's, you mentioned there, it's important to experience the sort of uh, success and the word failure as well. Um, how did the sort of, uh, I know obviously you said about the Man City and United um, approach, but how did that kind of come about? And then how was that transition? Because like you said, I mean, again, the benefit you had was you experienced the, like I said, the team that wasn't doing as well, the team that did do okay. Um, mm-hmm. But obviously going into an academy, like especially then when it had just changed into an academy, what was the structure like there and how did they, I know obviously current academies, they look to try and mould players into certain players. So they'll be like, you know, this is a City player and a City player, if you come into City, yeah. you like this. What, what was that transition like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, very, it was very, very different back then if you look at the City model right now, just because the way City are now, yeah. like you say, the, there's, a, there's an, identity, an identity that runs all the way through the club. And I think that's something which more teams are trying to incorporate now but even still, not many actually do do it. I remember from when I was first in City's Academy, obviously we we weren't, the team, the first team wasn't great. The reserves were all right. The Academy was all right. But we'd lose to Liverpool, lose to United. That's just what it was because they just had better academies and they had more success playing that way. Like Liverpool, that identity thing was Liverpool in the 90s. Liverpool Academy from under 10s all the way through to the first team played a certain way. From the way that they passed the ball around the back, it had to be a certain thing. It had to be this. There had to be this system. 
Whereas for us at, at that time, it was more so like a traditional, we just play a 4-4-2. And then depending on who your coach was, it would, depend, it would define how you wanted to play. And they weren't really being held accountable for playing styles, but being more accountable for success and like just developing players. So to enter that um, environment and like travel around, seeing some of the better teams like Liverpool's, as I say, like Man United's and so on, even Aston Villa's, I think it was. Like that was fun to learn. And you start to realise that what you had in terms of Sunday League got your attention. But as you got older, like that's a raw bit of ability. But yeah. now it's like it's time to be it's time to be polished. Like now, try and understand why we do this. Try and understand why we do that. This is important. Try and you develop this skill. Can you develop that skill? And it's stuff which, you know, potentially, you could do um, in a Sunday League type system. But it's not that important because yeah. you know the kind of the deal is just is just to win. But if you are in an academy now and your team loses every single game, but you produce three players from that team who go and play for the first team, like that's yeah. mission accomplished. But if you're playing in the Sunday League team, you're losing every single week. Nobody cares if three players are getting better because the fact is players will probably start to leave because they don't want to lose every week, especially yeah. as you get older. Um, so, yeah, so it's good to enter there and then to start to see the, the little changes, the different focus on technique, different focus on understanding about the game itself and stuff like that. And that has been taken to a whole new level now in terms of how the academies are. But, yeah, that's when you really you really start to learn the craft and learn what it takes to, to win games and, you know, to really develop as a player. And, you know, for as far as academies go, there were always players who would get hyped up from early doors because they were so great in Sunday League. But I'd probably say 80% of those people never make it to a first team. Yeah. Because it's probably that type of mentality where things were too easy for them, so they never took it seriously enough. Whereas for other people, like, you, you're more likely to get to an academy through a, a bit of skill and hard work than lots of skill and, like, a weak mentality. And, you know, we, we see it all the time. Yeah, no, totally. I, I always kind of say as well that sometimes, and not all the time, this and there is no magic formula to make as a footballer, um, but I always say that there's a mixture of potentially three things. So talent, motivation and opportunity. Because, like yeah. you said, you know, you may get picked up based on the talent you have. Um, but then, like you said, some of those boys or girls, whatever it may be, um, come into a, a system and they haven't got the motivation because they're like, well, I've made it. You know, I've been picked up by this club and yeah. you know, there'll be other players who probably don't realise it but have just got into that academy on the skin of their teeth and because of, you know, they maybe had one very good performance and someone's caught their eye and they've gone, wow, excellent, let's get this player in. But they're a really hard worker that constantly keeps on putting the effort in. Yeah. There, for me, there are some, there are some players who, this is just in, in regards to just raising kids yeah. and just life in general, there are some players who will always want to show you their strengths and then other players who always want to work on their weaknesses. Yeah. Like, if you see someone's great at free kicks, you'll see them every day or every Friday before a game, just weren't showing everyone, look at my free kicks, look at my free kicks, look at my free kicks. And like, yeah, that's great. But there are other things which, you know, you're not perfect yeah. at. Whereas with some other people, they're like, once you, from once you get into an academy, like, you've not arrived there by chance. From when you're playing professionally, you've not arrived there by chance. You're a good player. Yeah. You have the capabilities to find success. So the ones who are working hard or working hard and trying to advance their craft and so on, very quickly, they could be in a place where like, no, they can't take a free kick as good as this guy, but they can dictate a game, control a game, yeah. add more value to a game. You know, so some people be, like to be praised for, like, hate, they hate criticism, so like to be praised for what they're good at. But the people, they take praise well from being told how hard they're working, and that's what inspires them. And that's what always pushes them on. But other people, you know, Look at me. I, I was, look, I've scored this free kick 10 times in a row. You're like, oh, congratulations. It looks really good the first week. Then for the next 40, you're like, eh. <laughs> this is good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love that saying as well. You mentioned there about, you know, the showing the weakness and you know, the strengths and the weaknesses because I think it's so true. Um, I agree. I think, you know, mm -hmm. so often the ones, well, what they can, what players can do, they're happy to shout about that. But, you know, they don't want to, like you said, show or even pay attention to, to, to the weaknesses which they may have. So, I think yeah. as well, which is why you say even whatever you're at, really, that's the, the important thing. Um, and I think even in a modern mm -hmm. day and age, what we're in that now, and, you know, it's not to criticize anybody who does this, but Instagram, you know, people might put their, their, their show reel on Instagram, but, you know, and, and again, quite rightly, because they show themselves off, but it's all their best mm -hmm. clips. Where's the clips where, you know, I'm not saying just do one isolated based yeah, on exactly. what you haven't done well, but, you know, including some of those things to show that there has been development made. And I think that that's, an important characteristic as well, you know, showing that like yeah. I said, development can think, be made and yeah. 
I think for me, um, like that type of mentality, like I, I'm a hard worker. I'm very good at certain things. I'm not brilliant at other things, and I do work to continually improve. Like that's the thing every year. But say with some attackers who I've seen come through, I know we'll talk about Messi, talk about Ronaldo, and this, that, and the other. Talk about how they scored thirty goals, forty goals, and so on. And they said, "Oh yeah, scored thirty goals so easy for him." Blah blah blah. Thirty goals this season is arguably easier than thirty goals in next season. Yeah, because people have got time to figure you out now. It's the same reason teams that come up from the championship, they might do well in the first six months of the season and then in those last five months, like, they get found out. So it's different, you know. It's an understanding of continuous improvement, continual growth. Because if you think that what you are today is enough to get you through the next 15 years, I guarantee you will disappear before you even realise. The game's constantly evolving. And people, like, I... So when I chose to leave um, the UK, I, like, I, for my entire career, I've been, I watch football everywhere. And... I love all the different styles. I know what to get from certain leagues. If you want a certain thing, you look at it. So if you want a certain thing, you look at Germany. If you want a certain thing, you look at Spain. Like, I watch everything. And, like, with that mentality, I wanted to go elsewhere because as far as England goes, it was great that you can play and it's great leagues and stuff like that. But I'm playing against people for the 10th, 15th, 20th time. And you're yeah. doing the video before the game. Like, I could tell you for a fact, this player, that player, that player, when they get the ball in this spot, they do this yeah, and they do that and they do this. This guy will always pull to the back post. This guy will come short and then spin this. And like, I've seen it and it's cool, but then also like give me a different challenge because yeah. then I came over to America and I've watched games here, but I didn't watch that many games. And I remember the second game of my first proper season here, a guy was running at me and I didn't know if it was right or left footed. It's the most alive I've felt in the past five years because now I have to defend it just all yeah. out raw, figure it out. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. improvement. That's under, that's like learning that whole thing again, and that you know, as a thirty-three-year-old guy, like that's the type of stuff in my career, which gets which gets me going. Instead of knowing that this guy's going to do this step over, and then do this because that's what he always does. Yeah, I, I think even what you're saying there shows you know your your thinking's at another level, which is brilliant. Because I agree, I think you know, I, I'll be honest, with you, I haven't even looked at it in that way. And just listening to what you're saying, it's taken so much on board and so much that can be relayed to players because. You know, there's things like, you know, comfort zones and, and people, you know, mm -hmm. oh, like especially maybe in those sort of Sunday league or school settings, you know, you might know a kid from another school. You might play against a kid in um, a different Sunday league team, but you played them two or three times that season. So, you know, oh, he's the best player, she's the best player. But like you just said there, that's incredible because it's true. You play against players that you don't know. And all of a sudden, that's where the decision making, the psychological aspects start coming to it. Like I said, you know, yeah. is he better with his left? Is he better with his right? Actually, can he use both feet? Am I going to be in trouble and have to maybe give him more space? Am I going to have to put pressure on? Am I going to need support from somebody else? There's all these yeah. thoughts going through yeah. your mind. And I mean, I said a few of those thoughts, mm -hmm. you don't even have nowhere near as much time to be able to think like that. So you're having to <laughs> make a yeah. decision. Yeah. Um, it, so, it, like all, all that stuff there, it, literally, the more it's kind of. The, on the unknown, once that enters the fray, yeah. you have to be at your absolute best because yeah. certain things, like, it's just a subconscious thing. You just get used to it. You don't go through the motions as such, but you just play a certain way. Yeah. But now create something that is different. And you've, that's when you have to watch more video of the opposition. Yeah. Like, not, just the, not just like how they played last week. You're watching individual clips of this player because you know when you get out there, you need to try and find a tendency. It's kind of like how... Um, in the NFL and stuff like that. They do massive amounts of film study yeah. to know what this, which way is this guy going to go? Is he going to do this? When did he do that? When did he do whatever? Because these, it, within our game, it's those little moments that really matter. Yeah. You know, like why is, like when a goal is scored, why is this guy free at the back post? Because if you could probably look at video and see that that's his tendency. Yeah. So if you don't adapt yourself to it, what was the point of you being out there in the first place? Yeah. You know, there's, there's lots of stuff like that, yeah. I know, I agree. And I think that's why, you know, in the game, we're seeing now such a sort of transition to either specialist coaches or coaches, that paid, or, or I say coaches, but I mean, they're getting sort of both trades, they're getting the coaching element of it, but also the um, specialism element of it, where like there might be video analysis, they may just be movement or, or you know, personal type trainers, you know, and they're really they're looking for, like you said, those inch movements. So it might be, you know, a little twist of the knee. Okay, that means the player's going to, you know, accelerate yeah. quicker or you know all those split decision minutes I've got a great example for you yeah. yeah I've got a great example for you actually so one of uh, so goalkeepers do a lot of research about penalty takers yeah yeah. some of them might like I've been lucky enough to be to have like people like Alex Smithies who have like the record save percentage or whatever in the championship for penalties and he'd be watching a video 
Yeah. And to the naked eye, it looks like someone just steps up and goes a certain way. Like he would know which way someone's going to go based on which foot they're standing on or resting on and stuff like this. Yeah. Like when there's that level of detail that comes into something or even like where they stand in relation to the box, like the player themselves don't even realize they're doing yeah. that. Yeah. But when you really try and play up to it, you realize it's the little, little things that make a huge difference because he knows you're going to go there because his foot's there. Now he saves the penalty. The momentum changes him again, you know? Instead yeah. of just thinking, oh, well, I'll just guess this. No, pe- the more people study the game and start to really learn and understand it, I think the better they are as players and the better the yeah. teams can be overall. Yeah, no, totally. And also as well, like, again, it adds in, like, you know, within the sort of coaching, we talk about uh, technical, psychological, physical, social. And that split technical or even physical, you could class it as, um, type of body movement. Actually, now he's got a psychological uh, advantage mm-hmm. over the player because, you know, if, say, for example, it's in a penalty shootout, other players are now thinking, well, does he know about my movement? You know, does he know about my sort of positioning? Is he going to be able to decide on where I'm going? Or if that's early in a game yeah. and potentially he has a shot later on, what else does he know? You know, does he does he know that yeah. if I'm outside the box? So I think, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely massive. And it's interesting because the point you got on, I was going to kind of look at a sort of yeah. your, um, whole sort of professional career as, a, as one kind of big chunk. So, so you know, it said Sunderland, QPR, Man City, and obviously now Real Salt Lake. Yeah. Um, What's that been like in terms of the coaching that no one's received, but then also kind of like what you said there? I mean, you know, you played in some big games against big oppositions um, in terms of uh, cup competitions, playoffs as well. How does it change in terms of A, the manager, and B, the situation slash scenario? So, like I said, you're moulding the player, you have your abilities and your, your, your technical traits that you have. But then you know, you're playing in, say, for example, a playoff final or, you know, you're playing against, you know, Man United where, you know, regardless of whatever stage they're at, it's just a derby and, you know, those psychological elements come into yeah. it. I think the co- coaching has changed a lot over the years. So when I first came through, Kevin Keegan was my manager and yeah. he was probably ahead of his time in the way that he viewed the game because he would like to play. He said, just get the ball down. We want to try and play. This is how we're going to play. We're going to do this. And I remember one time I was thinking of 16 playing in a preseason game someone played a channel ball and I was running back and I was getting pressed by a guy and I just rolled it out for throwing and I'll never forget he spoke to me after the game he said listen we don't we don't want to do that we want you to get the ball we want you to play it back to the keeper start to play like in 2020 that makes perfect sense yeah but in 2003 for Man City that's not really something you expect to hear from a coach because like all the coaches that preceded him they weren't really like that in terms of how they viewed the game so it he was very good, but then there was always that 4 4 2. We're tough with this, with that, with the other. And then also, as an underdog, they kind of coach, coach you differently. If you're an underdog or you're not the best team in the world at playing and so on, like for a, for a manager and for a coach, if they don't have significant job security, then everything's about results. So the way that they'll coach you will be specific to just trying to get a result. Doesn't matter whether you're going to play well or a player's going to develop, it's literally just get a result. And with that, you know, you, you don't see many academy people really develop or flourish or whatever. It's, but we'll just get a result. We're going to sit back in. We're going to, like, we're going to bank in here. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about trying to play. Don't worry about doing this. Just we'll work on set pieces and so on. And that, um, as a player, you know, it's, it, it, it's disappointing. But it's also it is what it is. Because at some of those times, you, you're playing against, like, iconic Arsenal teams or iconic Man United teams or iconic, like, Chelsea teams and all this and who are known for being exceptional you know so if you think to yourself that you're going to go out there and go head to head with them and outplay them like that's how you get destroyed so it's almost like with those coaches they're most trying to instill discipline into your mind as opposed to you know free you up to try and play but then as City then became more of like the favourite they started to focus on style of play start to focus on identity which is like you say the word identity and it seems like an easy thing to say for a team like City and our team like Liverpool, but for years they never had it. Yeah. And identity comes from the way that people play, the way that people think, the way that people behave. And really, when someone comes in, if you try and bring that into a club, there are always going to be people who go against it because they believe in something else, especially when yeah. you're not getting the results. But when a club says, this is the way we're going to be, we're going to only going to bring people in who buy into this. And if you don't buy into it, you can leave. Before you know, it's a whole new club. It's a whole new mentality. Yeah. And then they find success with it. And that you can't argue. Yeah. Whereas, say, when I was at QPR, there were times where if we were playing, we had lots, but a real mix of people who'd played in the Champions League and people who were playing in the League One like the year before. 
yeah. or some of the ones who were in League One, they were basically the heart and soul of the club. But now you're bringing that mentality of Champions League winners and stuff, and you, they go into games wanting to play, as in just playing nice football. But some of the other ones going into games just trying to make sure that they win or trying yeah. to find a way to win. So there's a big uh, split in terms of how people like view the game. And when you're winning, it's fine. But then when you're losing, all of a sudden you've got 10 different ideas about how to fix things. Yeah. And from when that becomes the case, the coach can still be trying to say whatever he's trying to say. But depending on whether he's a coach who's come from League One or a coach who's managed in the Champions League, you can then, fight. You can then start to see splits in dressing rooms and things like this. And it's very easy for players to just like... It doesn't happen to everyone, but it only takes one or two people just giving up and not believing it for the toxicity to just spread through a camp. Yeah. So for me, as I think throughout the years, to be, to be completely honest, the best coaches I've had, whether I've liked them as a person or not, have been the ones who've, been, who've come in with an idea, stuck with it, whether it worked or didn't work, yeah. but then also provided a fair platform for everybody to the point where they knew that it doesn't matter who you are, if you're not pulling your weight, you'll be criticised. Because for me, the opposite of that are the coaches who come in, show favourable treatment to other people, allegedly say, these are the standards we're going to keep but then allow other people to not keep those same standards because then you can always point the finger and be like, well, why is he doing this and why is he doing that? And the way footballers are and just people in the world are, once you can ask why, then some people will just go all the way and say, well, I'm not going to bother them. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think that's a massively important point because, I mean, obviously, even in your, your time as well, you've been at clubs for set periods of time, it's like you know, QPR, obviously, like now Rio, so like City as well, for more than, say, for example, a couple of seasons. And... I think what's important mm-hmm. is that, like you said, there's going to be, you know, not to do with you, but to do with the hierarchy. If they make a decision on the club isn't doing well enough and you know what, the manager has had his time, all of a sudden now there's a new manager comes in. And like you said, if they come in with a new style of play and, you know, um, I, I do think that sometimes it does go down to sort of the name. So, you know, if you see a named manager come in and it's like, oh, well, do you know what, we know a bit about him and actually, do you know what, he's done really well in the past and I've heard good things then all of a sudden you're already into things even before they've maybe even implemented their ideas. But then obviously you can have the opposite mm-hmm. side of things as well where you get some managers who, it may be even like fresh young managers as well, which is, is a sad thing to, to hear because I think so often, you know, they're the ones that become the fresh new ideas. But if you get a group of players and they're like, well, do you know what? I don't really buy into this and I don't really get it. And if it doesn't kind of work, then, you know, so I think you mentioned about sort of a happy balance, really, of, you know, the manager coming in and sticking with their own, their own ideas, which is important because, let's be honest, they're the manager and obviously the players yeah. are the ones who are going to produce it, but they've come in for that reason. But then, obviously, allowing and understanding as well the players and, you know, their opinions and their feedback and their thoughts and, like, just that, that uh, fair. It is, that's very dangerous, though, because some players, like, even though they play on the field, they don't have a clue what's going on. Yeah. Like, there are a lot of people yeah. like that. But they, these are some of the ones who are very, very outspoken. They don't understand the sort of nuanced nature of the game itself. But an example of somebody who had no real personality towards players would be like a Roberto Mancini. Yeah. But one thing in which he did have was that every single day, especially for the time that I was there, they worked on team shape every single day without yeah. fail. Like the team could have played on Saturday and they were trained on Sunday. So all the team were inside getting massaged. He will find 22 players to make sure that everybody understands the exact way to play. He's bringing people up from academy reserves. He's got st- academy strikers playing at the back, like, every single day. So it got to a point where it was unequivocal. You knew exactly where you needed to be at every point in every scenario on the field. And yeah. people didn't enjoy the fact that we were doing that every single day, but City won the league. Yeah. So with that, the results are there. But then also with that, that workforce that year in 2012, for me, is something which sticks with me and I always talk about, I've spoken about from that point because I've played, I've played with some players since then who are good players, especially on paper, really good players, good players in training. But if they're not working hard, I say, well, I was lucky enough to see David Silva, Sergio Aguero, Edin Zeko, Yaya Torre, Torre, Colo Torre, Vincent Company, blah, 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 all these people. And they're working harder than I've ever seen you work. And they're also better than you are as a player. Yeah. So what makes you think you have the right to not work hard at your craft when there are people who are better players than you yeah. currently out working you? What are your ambitions? Are you just here to make the money or are you here because you want to achieve something? Because yeah. if you want to achieve something, this isn't enough. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think as well, it's interesting. I mean, I've spoken to players and they've said that when they got on loan in sort of their early stages of their career, 
um, maybe at a Premier League club and then they've gone down to sort of a League One, League Two, you know, the attitudes of different players is very noticeable at that level. So I can only imagine what is noticeable like at a Premier League or when players come um, from Champions League winning teams and things like that because you know, like some players are playing for their futures. You know, some players are playing mm-hmm. for the development purposes. Some players are playing because, like you said, it might be just money orientation and just think, you know what, I'm comfortable here, I'm getting a good wage. And I think that in terms of creating um, an environment, which is one of the big things people talk about within coaching a lot of the time, creating an environment is so important because, you know, it is that thing, like you said, there. maybe the environment of Mancini getting all those players to play in positions wasn't the greatest in terms of, you know, some strikers trying to score goals and some defenders just probably wanting to defend. But it's important. Mm-hmm. And obviously, credit to what happened, you know, there's something to signify that at the end as well. So having that sort of, to back it up, I think definitely sort of credits reasons and purposes for, for doing things the way that obviously he may, he may have done them. Um, but then mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. something as well I want to look at as well is you, again, you've kind of briefly mentioned it as well, but obviously again, you've played under some, some big name managers, some uh, different types of managers with varied styles of play. What was sort of the main thing that motivated you as a player and, and what sort of, uh, coaching or management did you really react well off of um so for me like as a player like I think I've always been a good player and if I don't start a season I always finish a season like I'll always get into a team like without question but there have been plenty of years where I've played pretty much every game and so on so I was always a good player and I've always been the type of player where people want me on their team in training like, without question, if it was to be picks or whatever, you'd never, never be the guy who's down near the bottom. That awkward, awkward situation. I'd never, never be that guy. So for me, the motivation was to have an influence on the game and people around me. Yeah. Like, now, especially as an older player, every day in training, can I make the people around me better? Can I do that? Can I see what inspires them and so on and so forth? Because as well as a defender, if people around me are playing well, my job's so much easier. Yeah. Like, if they get it, like, does I, I, I will hype people up goes from the point if the strikers I say we live and die by your attackers if the attackers are defending and attacking well at the back I am chilling because <laughs> if they're pressing if they're pressing well the yeah. ball never gets to me and if it gets to me it's not a great ball but if yeah. they're relaxing I'm under, going to be under more pressure so if they're doing well I hype them up if the midfielder are doing well I hype them up the defenders around me like if we're organised like the big the big revelation for me was probably 2013 or so when I played with Real Ferdinand Oh, maybe 2014, and he was talking about United. Obviously, they were one of the best teams and stuff, but he would be running six to seven kilometers a game, yeah? And the average for a centre-back is probably anywhere from nine to ten. That's the average, and he's running six to seven. Is it because he can't run? No. It's because he organises people around him to the point where he doesn't have to. Yeah. And that, for me then, made me have the mentality that when it comes down to playing this game, I want to do as much as possible to affect the game whilst doing the least amount of running. Yeah. And that's through understanding the game and helping people around you understand the game as well. So yeah, to get back to, I don't know why I got to that, but to get back <laughs> to the original question about who I came along with the most, I think I like the coaches who know what they're talking about yeah. and they have an idea. And if you ask them a question about it, they can answer. Yeah, they won't just point. say just this or just that. They will advance the point because they're the ones who make you feel calm. They're the ones where they can see something going on in the game. And you trust them to make a change which will positively affect the game. Whereas I've had some where they'll make a change and it will make no sense whatsoever. Like I've played in a, in a team under Stuart Pierce where we needed to win to get into the UEFA Cup. And he put a goalkeeper up front. And it just, and like, but that day he put a goalkeeper up front in an outfielder shirt. So he planned it for a week in advance. Yeah. You know, stuff like that slide, just slides under the radar. So yeah, the ones who really know what they're saying, the ones who buy into their structure, the ones who don't bully certain people just because they don't like them. Like everybody gets a fair shot. You get a fair shot to try and make the team. Like every week, if you can look at the starting 11 and be like, yeah, this team's fair and based on what we've seen for the week before or the weeks before that, that's the type of manager that you want because then you know yourself. If you get the opportunity or you train well, the opportunity will come to you and people will accept it because that's what it is. But unfortunately, that's not a lot of coaches. A lot of coaches have their favourites and they run with them and run with them and run with them and they end up dying with them, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the thing that's always the hardest to take, the ones who will just commit to something which is definitely harming them because they should be able to see better and know better. And, you know, I don't want to be a coach because it's obviously very, very complex, but 
if you can somehow find a way to motivate the workforce, you will always find good results because they will do anything for each other. Like yeah. just here now, um, we're getting ready to go to Orlando for this tournament. And like, there's, we've basically been playing 11 v 11s every other day for the past two weeks. And the starting 11, they've lost every single game. And the reason they have is because the people on the other side are more motivated and they work harder for each other. Yeah. So as a consequence, every single time, like if one player is out of position, somebody fills in. If something needs support, someone will be there. Whereas for the first team, like there's a little bit of toxicity within the camp. So like they don't get that same luxury. Yeah. You know, like, and it's stuff like that makes a difference. You motivate the workforce so you get the right people in there. Fine. Like you win. If City didn't have that squad in 2012 in terms of the way that they thought and their technical ability, I guarantee you they wouldn't have won the league because on a day to day basis, there was no enjoyment on that training field. Yeah. Yeah, that no, makes total sense. And again, you kind of picked up an important point there about relationships. I find relationships on the pitch so important because, like you said, it's the understanding of each other. And I suppose you know, to an certain extent, potentially that was kind of developed under the way sort of Mancini he said, developed uh, his training, you know, where it's understanding how players feel in different positions, type of situations they'll be in in different positions. You know, if you're always playing in central midfield, but then you get put as a fullback, understanding that you're going to have a really pacey winger running at you and you've got to make a quick split decision to second, you know, it's, it's quite obviously intimidating for them probably. But I think, yeah, relationships are so important over the pitch in understanding traits and strengths and weaknesses. And like you said, that, that workforce, if you kind of all work with each other, I think like you said, especially with some managers, they'll pick players and they go, right, that's my favourites. And like you said, they'll go down with that ship as well. And, you know, unfortunately, mm-hmm. the, players, the players are the ones that survive. You know, they're the ones who get back on that ship, but mm-hmm. the manager sails. So I think, you know, yeah, it's yeah, so important sure, to get that sure. team cohesion and the, the, the sort of balance between that. Um, one thing I did want to kind of pick up on as well. So obviously um, in terms of uh, England under 21 representation as well, how, how did that sort of develop within your career? And how did you find that as well? Because obviously that's, again, totally different really, because you've got your club environment and then you've got your international yeah. one where mm-hmm. it's only a couple of days Per year, almost. Yeah, the 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 under twenty one setup and the way it happens is like it's cool. Your very first time with it is is incredible, you know. Yeah. Because it's like an indication that you're doing well. Because as far as representing England went, again, this is like for I don't know if it's still the same now, but my academy team by the time I was under fifteens and the sixteens, we were a very good team from under sixteens through to under like 17s 19s we maybe lost four games across three years yeah and it was a team mostly full of mancunians and i think there were like two irish two welsh or whatever and in that time nobody from my team ever got called up to the under 16s to play in a victory shield yeah nobody then ever got called up to play for the under 17s or the 18s nobody nobody at all but there were people who made their who played in the victory shield from the 16s and then they stayed in those England youth ranks all the way through to under 21s, even if they weren't playing for their club side. So I, my first ever call-up was actually, I think, for the under 20s, uh, which is like a rare game for the under 20s, but it was a home against Russia. And I just left Stamford Bridge. I think I just played against Chelsea in the Premier League. And I would get there and I'm like, oh, this course is really exciting, blah, blah, blah. And then you look, at, you look through the programme on game day and there's a player who's also about to make their debut, but he just made his debut for the reserves the week before. Yeah. I'm just left Stanford Bridge from playing there. But yeah. the two of us have been selected to play in this. And that player who just made his debut for the reserves, he played through every age group from England. Every age group. Yeah. So that side of it was, I found that to be nuts. So I played in that under 20s game. And this is me as an under 19. I played in the 20s game, scored, we won 2 0. And then there was an under-19s European Championships in that summer. I was on standby for the under-19s in a squad full of people who weren't playing week in, week out in the Premier League or playing anywhere near that level. So I was like, all right, fine. But anyway, you play for the 21s. And then the way the 21s is, as soon as you meet up, everything's about the two-year cycle to get to the European Championships. That is the be-all and end-all. You meet up, right, these are the games to qualify. This is what we've got to win. This is getting towards the time where if you win, you've got the playoff and then it's tournament time. So everything around that isn't necessarily about development yeah. because they won't try and coach you to that level. It's just purely about trying to win games and play, play good football. But you do have the better or the best players of that age group in, in those teams. 
but it's all about European Championships. If you don't qualify for the Euros, it's a failure. It doesn't matter if one or two of the players end up playing for the first team, it's a failure. Because over, over the years, it's been that the teams who have traditionally done well in those European Championships, their players have gone on to play yeah. for the first team. Yeah. That's a big thing because the year when we went and we lost in a final, we got killed in a final by Germany, that was the same Germany team where after that, the, there was Jerome Bowe saying, Manuel Neuer, Mats Hummels, Meza Ozil. Like, yeah. in f- so many of them went straight from that tournament straight to the first team. You know, like, that's, it's a big deal. People know that you do well there. You could, some people could get a move, but on the national stage, your first team will realize, like, this is, this is it. So, yeah, the coaching, the coaching is different. It's not about development, but, you know, at that stage there, you, you probably expect it to be in the major first team ranks. And at that point, again, because yeah. of relegation and promotion, stuff like that, like, it's, there's no time to develop you. Yeah. You're either good enough or you're not. And, you know, <laughs> if ultimately, if, if, you could, if someone says, oh, you guy be good in six months, you'll probably work in a team that's near the top because the team down the bottom is not going to play in for six months because as soon as you lose your status in the Premier League, that's nev- that might never come back. Yeah, it's interesting as well. You mentioned about the sort of, uh, I suppose, favouritism almost in a way where players, you know, who weren't playing for their, their, their club teams or probably have never even played for their club teams are being able to get into mm-hmm. these certain age groups. And I think, you know, to, to one extent, it's a positive in the sense of, like, you know, well, at least maybe they're getting relationships with other players. And, you know, similar to a team environment, really, you're getting groups of players that, you know, work with each other. So, like you mentioned about the German model, where they've all kind of gone through each other in a certain age. However, you know, they don't credit themselves a, a place, you know, for their international age group if they've never even played in these yeah. environments, like you, like you said you was mentioning. So I find that interesting. And also as well, yes, that's why I kind of wanted to pick up on that, that, that point, really, about the international side of things, because you know, obviously people say it's a great honour to play for, you know, your country and, and things like that. But the, the problem is, is that, you're not there that often because you're only there for a couple mm-hmm. of times, or, you know, after the year. Um, like you said, mm-hmm. let's be honest, you're going to have other things on your mind, whether that be you're a team at the top of the table and you're fighting for, you know, honours there yeah. or you're a team at the bottom end of the table and, you know, you're fighting to stay in the league. So, yeah, I always find international ones hard because, and also as well, the thing is that you don't get film sort of relationships with the manager either because, you know, um, mm-hmm. you're seeing them every so often and, yeah, obviously they're getting to come up to you and, and then see you play, but, you know, you don't get to understand their way of things. So I think the way they've kind of gone about it now with a like, whole DNA makes a bit more sense and, you know, there's a sort of a pattern in the system and I suppose it follows a little bit of suit to what clubs do in terms of that identity and that sort of, you know, continuation throughout different um, age groups. So, yeah, it's yeah, interesting. For sure. interesting for sure. point. Um, so, again... You've obviously gone over your whole career. Great sort of insight into sort of where you first started out in terms of some of the um, things along the, what, the way of the journey and obviously to currently where you are now. Um, and there's been some great insight from, I suppose, well, players' perspectives, but also from coaches' perspectives as well. Um, they usually probably get, you probably get a cliche question of, you know, what advice would you give to players? But what I'm going to do is put a bit of a spin on it here um, as a whole is what mm-hmm. advice would you kind of give to coaches to be aware of from a player's perspective. So, I mean, again, you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on about, you know, making sure that kind of, you know, you're fair to your players and, you know, there's that sort of equal balance really there. But is there anything else kind of you would say coaches need to be aware of maybe when taking over a team or trying to develop players? Is, is this at a professional level? Um, yeah, potentially, even something that could be sort of done throughout, really. Um, I would say... Uh, something which makes the biggest difference is having an understanding of your players because as, t- as time has passed now in the 90s you could have Roy Keane as a captain who could just shout and everybody would have to accept it you bring a Roy Keane into a dressing room right now with that same tone and he will no. make it worse because people will just go within themselves and almost fear playing yeah. so it's a different it's a completely different workforce and don't get me wrong some people will still like to be shouted at and some people still like that friction but a lot of people don't you know it's a different not just a generation of football, it's just a different generation of people. Yeah. So I think to be able to see what is going on with people, what really drives them, what doesn't drive them, when they're, when they're up, when they're down, it means that when something needs to be changed, you know the best way to deliver a message to that person. Like some people um, are great at taking on tactics through video. Some people are better at seeing it on the field. Some people are better at just being told, like someone could be told, I need you to stand here when this happens. 
and then you can walk away and you know that they'll always stand there but then yeah. other people would say get to stand here and understand that it means stand here in this theoretical situation but understand that it's nuanced and that sometimes you can go elsewhere like there's so many different ways to deliver a message and i think the best coaches realistically are the ones who will always have their idea of what they believe is right or wrong or how they want to play but know the best way to deliver it to the workforce that way whereby um say for like for the last two years like i'm a city fan but for the last two years overall liverpool have been very very good and i think one of the reasons they've been very very good is because they've been so inconsistent in the way that they play when you play against them it's almost like a simulation and that's because every player understands where they need to be and they make the right decisions more often than not whether it's the case of somebody coming short and someone coming long at the same time to the timing of a pass to understanding why for example like i see so many attackers that don't want to run in behind but if they run in behind, it creates space for somebody shorter. You know, it's little yeah. things like that. Understand what it is to be selfless. Understand what it is to play the game. Understand why that is a thing. Why the City, why the Liverpool, why Bayern Munich, why Real Madrid, why Barcelona's killing teams in possession? It's because they've always got a threat in behind, which occupies the back four. Whereas other people say, yeah, but I'm not going to get, I'm not going to run, I'm not going to get it, like blah, blah, blah. Get yourself a coach who can explain to you exactly why you're doing what you're doing and show the benefit. And then as a consequence, you'll have a workforce which understands the game better, understands their own tactics better, and within the game itself can make decisions which they know. They don't necessarily need a coach to come and tell them how they can, they're can. they wise enough to know and make a difference together. So yeah, for me, a coach, understand the players, understand the best ways to get messages across. Fantastic. I think, yeah, though you need to understand the players because there's going to be differentiation within the groups, not even just technically, but also you know, socially and psychologically as well. So I think that's massive. And even there, that, that word is so often neglected. Why? You know, from a player's perspective and from the coach's perspective, they need to understand why they're telling a player to do something and they need to understand why they're telling them to do that something in the way that they're doing it. Because like you said, you know, mm -hmm. players, some of them like listening to things, some of them like watching things, some of them like just doing it and getting feedback on it. And yeah, I think that's, that's massively important. And um, yeah, the, the yeah. two bits there, that's a great piece of advice, not only for coaches, but also for, for players as well. Because, you know, players, again, being aware that, yeah, we're different and we're all going to have to sort of adapt and, and, and be aware of that as well. So... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, Nadam, I won't take up any more time. Um, it's been a fantastic chat, um, well, especially this end as well. Just listening to the discussions that have been coming out. I mean, you know, it's obviously an open discussion, but at the same time, some of the level of detail that you've gone into has been a fantastic insight, not only for myself, but like I said, for the people who will be listening to this. And I think it gives credit to your career and what you've achieved within your career, but also your intelligence as a footballer. And I think you mentioned it quite a lot throughout the discussion, but game understanding. And I think so often footballers are technical, 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 technical. But game understanding is, for me, just as important. And you know, through, like I said, discussions and, and, and the way you've carried yourself, it shows that you have that game understanding. And I think that what's going to happen now with you being at Real Salt Lake is those players are almost... There's a, there's a thing that I always sometimes say that coaches are helping players to become almost the next set of coaches. And I know you said you don't particularly want to go down the route of coaching, yeah. but I think, you know, having that game yeah, understanding, absolutely. it does. Yeah, I, I, I like to think I'm making a difference to the younger players on this team now yeah. through letting, teaching them, like, why, why, I say to them, why do you think that's a good idea? Okay, why, why do you think that's a bad idea? Like, understand that what it, like, game, a team of 11 people who have game understanding who are not the best ability in the world will always be a team that doesn't understand how to win a game. Yeah. That's just what it is. Even historically as well, when people look at someone like Frank Lampard and his goal record, like someone says, ah, oh, it always seems to drop to him on the edge of the box. Do you think that's by chance? Or do you think that's him understanding the flow of the game yeah. and understanding where people's positions are, understanding what his own players' tendencies are when it comes to putting balls in the box? You get this game, you can thrive. If you don't, you'll forever be like pushing water uphill, basically. Yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, again, the level of detail is so, so important. Um, and from a player or coach's perspective so yeah fantastic insight um Nadam, again big thank you for taking part in this some fantastic messages shared um listen hopefully the tournament does start up soon and you can get back out onto the field and, and show that technical side as well but um yeah I, i'll let you go for now but um again like i said thank you for taking part and um i'll uh, look to catch up with you all right yes sir thanks for reaching out no problem